Well, praise the Lord, everybody, and welcome back to the second hour of Nightline. We had such a wonderful time on the first hour. Our guest was Pastor Fear Corbett from Second Wind Ministries, and I tell you, God really blessed our hearts tonight. My name is Annie T. Broughton, in case you didn't catch it on the first hour. I'm happy to be your host for the evening. And we do have another awesome author with us on the second hour. He's none other than Mike Napa. He's the author of 29 Days to Different Love, a journaling devotional. And I want to share a little bit about Mike before I go to him. Mike Napa is an Arab American Christian and a best-selling award-winning author with more than a million copies of his book sold worldwide. So again, I'm asking you to call someone and tune in and hear what Mike is going to be sharing with us tonight. I read his book. His book is awesome. So you need to hear what God is going to be speaking through this powerful young man of God. So Mike, how are you? Well, I feel good now that you call me a young man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel good now. Well, my, you are a young man, and, uh, you know, I see youth, I see handsomeness, I see anointing, I see all kind of great things about you tonight. <laughs> well, I like that. Let's just go <laughs> with that. So how are you? Uh, I'm, I feel good. We're I'm in Colorado, and uh, we have springtime that is happening here. Springtime in Colorado means there's one day that's just a bunch of snow, and the next day the sun is shining, and so I love both of those things. So I feel good about it. I can imagine it. And we're having some spring weather here, and so I'm happy about that as well. So, Mike, uh, first of all, thank you for being with us on Nightline. Have you been with us before? I have not. So this is my, I'm a rookie here. That's good. That's, that's so good about that, too. <laughs> well, thank we you. are all super happy and super excited to have you with us on Nightline. To God be all the glory. <laughs> all glory to God. Yep. Amen. And we're going to have a great time tonight. And I just want you to open up and share about your life, about the books that you have written, uh, about what God is doing in your life. And just we're going to let the Holy Spirit have its way. All right, let's do it. I have to warn you, once I get talking and telling stories, I don't stop. So you have to cut me off from time to time. <laughs> well, you know what? You can just share all you want to because what we want to do tonight, we want to uh, let the viewing audience know that God is doing great and marvelous things in your life. Amen. 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 So to... how many books have you written? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I, quit, I quit counting. Uh, it's somewhere between uh, somewhere between 60 and 70, somewhere in there. Uh -huh. uh, I've been doing it for a while. For a while. Yeah. Well, you guys waited a long time to get me on the show. That's all I'm saying. Since it's been such a long time, since we, took, we waited a long time to get you on the program, that means we got to bring you back really quickly. <laughs> okay. We got to make we'll up. Do. We got to make up for the lost time. <laughs> that other than you are author what are some other things that you do uh well my full-time job i'm actually a director of marketing at a data intelligence firm and then uh i um i'm on the teaching team at my at my church and so i'm involved with that i'm working on a um right now believe it or not on the side i'm working on a, a video game and well uh, what do they call it augmented reality Game. So I'm writing scripts for that. I stay kind of busy, um, but I prefer to be busy than to just sit and stare at the wall. So. Yeah, I don't so. blame you for that. See, that that in itself keeps you young, staying busy. That, <laughs> I, I just love that you keep calling me young. I feel so <laughs> I the story that day a man called me sir, and I was like, I looked behind me, I was like, who are you talking to, <laughs> sir? I don't know who that is. But. So you just keep telling me I'm young, and maybe I'll believe it by the time we're done here. Well, maybe that young man was from the South. You know, we believe in Southern hospitality. You know, we say, mm -hmm. sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. You know, so. <laughs> All right. I grew up in the dirty South. <laughs> I grew up in Oklahoma. It's called the dirty South. So I still say, sir, and ma'am, and yes, sir, and all that kind of stuff, too. So yeah, maybe he was from somewhere around there. <laughs> yes, ma'am. So are you married? Uh, I have been married. My wife passed away in 2016, uh, cancer. 
cancer took her away from us. Mm -hmm. uh, we were married for 30 years. Wow. And here's, what I have to say is um, not that just we were married, we were actually happily married for 30 years. So yeah. I understand that's a bit of a, a unique thing. Um, she was uh, my partner in life, my partner in writing. Uh, she was a, a just beautiful soul. And uh, I actually wrote a book about her as well. Yeah. Um, when she was passing away called um, Hard Way Home. And it just kind of is the, it's a story of, of her struggle with cancer and then how that eventually ended up. But that's a different book. We're not supposed to talk about that one here, right? <laughs> Well, you can share whatever you want to share today. This is your interview, and so we're just happy right. to, to have you with us. But yes, you are the author of a, a book. You said that you wrote this book several years ago. Um, yes, ma'am. It's called 29 Days to Different Love, a Journaling Devotional. Is that correct? Uh, that's close. <laughs> I think that uh, it was originally called an interactive devotional. Oh, OK. And my uh, my publisher changed it to a, a journaling devotional because there are some journaling prompts in it. But this is one of those books that was um, I was looking at uh, I was I was looking at I have this the way that I approach scripture. I um, when I was a younger man, scripture to me was all about territory. Yeah. I'm going to read this many chapters in a day. I'm going to read this much in a month. I'm going to read this much in a year and get through the whole. You know, after you do that a few times, after you've gone through the Bible a few times. Um, that that's not as exciting as it once was. And I, I encourage that for younger people. But after a while, I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just start reading passage. And I'm just going to keep reading that passage until God's done speaking to me about it, until I'm done asking questions about it, until I'm finished with whatever I'm doing. And so I was in Galatians 5, and I was reading the Fruit of the Spirit passage, Galatians 5, 22. And I got stuck in there for several days just reading that over and over. And I thought, you know what? I really want to, um, I want to learn how to cultivate this in my life. Uh -huh. uh, not only that, I want to help someone else cultivate that in their lives. Uh -huh. And as I was working through how to do that, I um, started looking at other people's opinions and, and things, and I just got really tired because everyone was saying, in order to get the fruit of the Spirit in your life, uh, you know, go to church, read the Bible, pray a lot, uh, talk to your neighbors. And, and there was just this like to-do list of things that I was supposed to do in order to create the Holy Spirit's uh, fruit in me. And I, and I happened to look at that and I thought, this just seems, well, I won't say the bad word, but it just seemed backward yeah. to me. Uh -huh. um, and I thought, there's got to be, if this is really the fruit of the Spirit, Yes. That means that his spirit is making that fruit. That doesn't mean that I'm creating a fruit through my efforts and my hard work and all that kind of stuff. And I, it reminded me of when Christ uh, spoke about the, the, he is the vine and we are the branches. Okay. And we can't do any, I think the end of that scripture is, without me, you can do nothing. And I thought, I wonder what nothing means. And so I looked it up in the Greek and you know what it means? It means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it means without him, I'm incapable of creating anything good in my life. And so I thought, well, if I really, and I was thinking of my, uh, you know, people in my, uh, I was in a small group with some, uh, another story, but I got caught in a small group with people who were like 30 years younger than me for some reason, and they all were wonderful. But they asked me so many questions. And I thought, if I want to help these kids, to me, they're kids, they're like 25, 30. If I want to help these kids really cultivate this in their lives, the best thing I can do is not give them a chore list and say, do this, do that, the other. The best thing I do is just tell them how to plant themselves in Jesus, how to understand uh, what Christ is, not only has done, but is doing and will do in their lives. And so I thought, what happens if I take this very first quality of the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, yeah. and if I sat down and said to you, Lord Jesus, what does this mean? How, how do you love how do you love me? Yeah. And then what does that mean for my life? And so that kind of became the basis for the book, 29 Days to Different. Uh, just the idea that if we want to really cultivate the fruit of Christ's Holy Spirit in us, we must plant ourselves into Christ mm -hmm. instead of to do his work for, uh, for, for him.
I hope that made sense. It does make sense. And one thing that I love about your book is that when you did share uh, from Galatians 5, 22 and 3 and 3, you said, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit uh, in our life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self there is no law against these things. And when you share that in your book, I mean, I just stayed right there on that one page for the longest. <laughs> That's the way I do it. I, I got to say, I was in there for probably two, two and a half weeks, three weeks, just reading that same passage over and over. Um, I figure I just keep reading until God stops talking, right? I know. I know. Well, to God be all the glory tonight. We are having a wonderful time tonight um, with Mike Napa. He is the author of a wonderful journaling devotional. Um, it's 29 Days to Different love and so really you can just take this book and and you can open it up and you can just read like one chapter a day and let the Holy Spirit just talk to you and speak to you and and just encourage your walk in Christ and I know that's what it did for me a lot of times when we read God's Word you know we have to have a refresher course you know to learn how to love and, and to be loved and accept the love of God right now we're getting ready to go to Andrea Holman uh, she's going to be singing tightrope. Amen. <laughs> Wow, so again, we're having such a wonderful time tonight on Nightline 
with the beautiful Andrea Holman. And I tell you, God is using her tonight to be a blessing to us. So feel free to just call in and just be blessed of the Lord. Again, we are talking to uh, Mike Napa. Uh, he wrote a devotional, 29 Days to Different Love. And I love his devotion. I love him. I love his heart. I love his spirit. <laughs> so, Mike. <laughs> I, again, we are so thankful to have you with us. I, I'm hoping that one day that you can come and be with us in person. That would be, be wonderful. <laughs> so tell us, how is your book, how is this book different from any other devotionals that we may see uh, there on the shelf somewhere? Yeah, that's a big deal. The, um, most times when you read a devotion book, it's the kind of the short, you tell a story, you read a little quote and then there's a little prayer and um, those are great. I, I know a lot of people who love those. I was not satisfied with that. And so for this, what I wanted to do is I want us to, I wanted to get us um, to get a little bit deeper than um, just that surface moment. And so uh, the way this book is structured is there's, uh, there's seven days. You, you, we dig into one scripture for seven days, one set of scriptures for seven days. And in those seven days, There'll be a couple of times when it's just kind of straight story. Then there'll be some times when it's exegetical. We learn it. We're just kind of digging into what's there. But there are also things that I call emotion exercise, where I get you to try to live the experience that's happening uh, in the scripture. We forget, I think, that um, what we read is not just old stories. There are actually people. People yeah. lived yeah. these situations. And when we talk about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, she was actually lived that experience. When we talk about um, the Apostle Paul talking about how he sees 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. We talk about, you know, the way he lived this. And so we try to get, I wanted to get people to experience that emotion of those moments as well. And then we have, I call them imagination exercises where we just say, okay, let's stop for a minute. Yeah. Look at this scripture. Now, how would we, if we were to paint this scripture on our window, yeah. how would we that kind of thing. So if you uh, uh, if you're out there and you're looking for just another one of those, let's read a story and have a little one sentence prayer at the end. You're not going to get that here. Uh, and there's actually uh, at the end of every week is is what I call a comfort zone challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and when I was I was testing this with uh, some readers, they were like, "Well, would I ever do this?" And I'm like, "Well." You know what? It's up to you. You don't have to do the comfort zone challenge, but I've done these, and I can guarantee you that if you do them, you will be you you will like it. Yeah. Um, so uh, this is not it's not your grandpappy's it's not your grandpappy's devotional. Um, so <laughs> be prepared for that if you're going to take it on. <laughs> when I was reading your book, and you did spend a lot of time talking about uh, the love chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, and we said love is kind, love is gentle, love is patient, you know, uh, and then you refer back to the Apostle Paul. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, in his time with Barnabas and Mark. Yes. <laughs> My wife, uh, when she was in college, uh, she shared with me her journal. This is uh, probably after we got engaged, before we got married, and she had written an entry that said, why do all the right words come out of all the wrong mouths? <laughs> Yeah. Because she had a crush on one guy. He wasn't really interested, but all these other guys, she was a beautiful woman. All these other guys were interested in her, but she was like, they're saying the right things, but they're not the right person. And when I um, <clears throat> when I read 1 Corinthians 13, when I read Paul talking about love, I think, man, this is beautiful. Yes. This is just a beautiful thing to say. But you know what? Paul wasn't qualified to say this because, because Luke sold him out. Luke yeah. sold him out. In the book of Acts, and he told us what happened with him and Barnabas and John Mark. And, and when you look at that situation with Paul and Barnabas and the split that happened with John Mark over John Mark, Paul violates all the things that he says about love in 1 Corinthians mm. 13. And I think, you know what? Um, if we were to judge everyone by, uh, if we were to say that no one could say truth uh, unless they fully lived that truth, we would just, I, I'd be out of luck and yeah. all of that. Um, so I had to deal with that a little bit in scripture and in this book and the idea of, well, we know that Paul didn't always live up to his grandiose things. Does that mean it's not true? Or does that mean what happened? And I, and I came to the conclusion that God loves both the speaker and the hearer enough yeah. to move past, uh, the fall, the failings that we have, uh, to get us closer to where he wants us to be. And the good news is we have an indication that toward the end of his life, Paul and, and John Mark 
reconciled. Um, and so that love probably did bloom in the correct way later. Um, but sometimes I feel like I have to just deal with that. I have to ask the question. I can't whitewash my heroes and say, well, you know, he said this and I'm going to ignore the parts of them that were, that were bad. So anyway. <laughs> you shared a story in your book uh, about your granddaughter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I shaved my beard and I shaved it off. When you when, out the light here and she loved it. Yeah. <laughs> how long was it? When it, it was about, how, Right really? the clock, right under here. It was nice and. And so. I look at the shroud of Turin with the, you know, but. So when yes. I when I read when I read that portion of your book about your granddaughter, and so she calls you. What does she refer to you as? She calls me Dumpy. Dumpy. Uh, first of all, hey PG, hey Kate, <laughs> nice to see you. Uh, she calls me Dumpy, and I I'll go ahead and tell you the story. Yeah, tell me the story. Uh, when when uh, when. My daughter-in-law, when she was pregnant with Gigi, she asked what I wanted to be called. Um, and I said, I think I'd like to be called Grampy. And uh, everybody said that was fine. So but then um, Gigi came over to the house one day. She was about two years old. And she was walking around. And she looked at my wife and she said, um, where's Dumpy? Where's Dumpy? And they were like, what? And she's like, Dumpy, where's Dumpy? And she couldn't say Grampy. And at first we thought, you know, she had a bad diaper or something, but that wasn't the case. Um, and we realized, they realized that she was looking for me, that she couldn't say Grampy, so, but it came out as Dumpy. And so, you know, we went and played and stuff. The next day she came in and she tried really hard and she said, where's Grampy? She tried to say it. And I was in the other room and I could hear them. And my wife leaned over and she said, you mean Dumpy? <laughs> Dumpy. And I thought, okay, well, if my two favorite women in the world uh, like to call me Dumpy. I think that's the name that I want it to be called. And yeah. so ever since then, they all call me Dumpy. And it's funny, we're in a grocery store sometimes, and they'll see me, like, the, we'll meet in the grocery store, and then these two children will start screaming, Dumpy, Dumpy. And people will look at me like, are they calling you what I think they're calling you? Yep, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. So, yeah, she calls me Dumpy. And so she was sharing about how you had a long beard. And she, yeah. I mean, how she used to, you know, play in your beard and put bowls in your beard and different yeah. things like that. And then she said, Dumpy, if you shave your beard, she said, then you wouldn't have to deal with so much terror. But she was really yeah. talking about being a terrorist, right? Yeah, okay. so I, I am an Arab American Christian and I am routinely, um, I am routinely profiled uh, at airports, and I am, uh, I have been uh, the, on the wrong side of uh, racist outbursts and things like this. And um, I think at that time I had come through a situation where someone had been unkind uh, because of my because of my face, and yeah. um, she was worried about me. And I, I found myself in that weird moment of this is a teachable moment to teach her about uh, racism and, and things like that. But I, I didn't know what to say. It was right before her bedtime, so I kind of punted. I kind of was like, well, don't you worry about it, Gigi. You just go to sleep and have good dreams. But it is true that we have, um, we have some problems in this country. I mean, I was born in, in Oklahoma. I am like fourth generation American. So I'm 100% American by both birth and culture, but I'm also 100% Arab by heritage and family. My great grandfather came to the United States in the early 1900s and he actually earned his citizenship fighting for the United States in World War I. He was gassed in one of the trenches and was given an honorable discharge. And then that began my family history over 100 years now uh, in in the United States at the same time. Um, you'll tell me if I'm running out of time, right? <laughs> well, you got about three minutes, but I do need to ask you a question, okay? Okay. Where can we find more information about your book? Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you, you, get this book, you get this book anywhere books are sold. Uh, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. Uh, the publisher is Hendricks & Rose Publishers. You can check out their website as well. Uh, it's You can find it pretty much anywhere, yeah. And the second question I want to ask is because I am enjoying this interview so much, ah. 
<laughs> will you please come back and be with us again on Night I will. Live? <laughs> I will absolutely do that. And we can talk about my wife and hard way home next time if you want. And then thirdly, we had some people to call in tonight. So before we go off the air, <clears throat> will you please pray over all these requests that was called in tonight? Would you do that, Forrest? I would do that. Yes, I would. Are there <laughs> any particular that we should raise to, we should mention in the conversation? Well, or, someone uh, said they need surgery soon. Um, someone said they're praying for um, healing from uh, recovery. Someone has a heart murmur that they're praying for. Okay. Um, someone need a miracle for their child. Need, I'm sorry, a miracle a for A miracle child? for their child. Yeah, they didn't go into any detail. They said need a miracle for their child. Uh, okay. Someone else is suffering from depression. Right. Um, that they need prayer for that. Oh, someone else said that um, going to nightclubs, pray that he would stop going and have a closer walk with the Lord. Okay, so he's just <laughs> dealing with depression, right? Yeah. All right. Lord Jesus, it is a very special <laughs> special and kind thing that you've allowed us to be together today, uh, yes. particularly with Annie here and just the way that she has boosted my self-esteem. I pray you bless. Hey, um, there are some things going on. I know you know about them, but we want to talk about them too. Uh, I want to start with my brother who's been going to nightclubs and looking for temptation. He has a divided heart. He longs for you, Lord, but he also, he has uh, loneliness and he has fear. I believe he has shame too, Lord. It's time for you to take care of that, if you don't mind. Um, Lord, I pray you would just begin to let your spirit become known to him, to become aware right? that when he faces that temptation, God, I ask that you would remind him of the things that he loves more than that temptation. Remind him of the things that matter more to him than that temptation. Surround him with people who, who will lift him up and, uh, and guide him. And most, most, Importantly, Jesus, he just needs your experience. He needs to experience you personally, uh, in spirit, actively. God, I also want to lift up to you these needs in terms of surgery and recovery and the heart murmur, Lord. These things are inherent in our in our world, in this body, in this so I pray. My first request is always going to be for healing, Jesus. Love it. I know that you do, and I've seen it myself. I also know that sometimes you have healing pause so that we can get better healing in the world to come. And so, God, I pray you peace in these situations, regardless of you. I pray that you're peaceful. You would uh, not, be, not leave me without peace. You know what? I just want you to heal. If you don't mind. Uh, I'd ask you to do that. And Lord, there's a person who feels depression. I feel like there's more than one. 